Yeah, so we've got a second uh, keynote presentation this morning. Uh, it's um, another international speaker. So Mark Matthews has uh, come from South Africa and he's going to be talking about uh, well, his day-to-day uh, his -day business and looking at uh, uh, online monitoring and remote services of uh, cyanobacteria um, and be giving us a whole range of uh, applications of this uh, from different parts of the world and some focus here within Australia. So pass over to Mark, we're a little bit behind schedule already so uh, we'll have questions at the end and, uh, and then a morning tea break after that. So welcome Mark. You can use either this one or if you want to hold something. Yeah I'll just use that, that one. one. Thanks. Okay. Great, yeah. You've got oh, 30 so. minutes, right? Yeah, you've got 30 minutes. Okay, good. Oh, that's long. Yeah, you've got plenty of time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great. Good morning, everyone. I'd just like to say uh, it's a huge honor to be giving this keynote here this morning. And I'd just like to thank uh, the entire organizing committee, Richard, uh, Lisa, Rita, and others who've uh, helped. Uh, thanks, thanks very much to them. It's a privilege to be here. Um, as uh, Richard mentioned, I'm from Cape Town, South Africa. I did my PhD at the University of Cape Town a couple of years ago and uh, started a company called Sinolakes. And um, I'm currently an honorary research associate at the University there um, of Cape Town. And um, what I'm going to be showing you this morning is the um, online monitoring service that we've developed um, and has been used in South Africa over the last three years. And um, I'm hopefully not going to go into too much uh, technical details around uh, the, the inner workings of what we do, uh, but uh, really the, I guess the, the audience for this uh, talk is more situated at uh, water utilities, health authorities, um, rather than a pure science talk. Um, if you're interested in the pure science, uh, you, well, I can give you a number of papers you can go and read, or you can come to a, a, a pure science conference uh, if you'd like. But uh, yeah, let's not waste any further time. So as a company, as a business, what we do is we offer a, a solution for monitoring cyanobacteria, water pollution, and algae and weeds, effectively aquatic weeds, in lakes and seas, uh, which is from your desktop and in near real time. And um, this is an effectively uh, amounts to an online monitoring and mapping service for utilities, um, aquaculture, industry, health authorities, etc. And um, why cyanobacteria? Well, I think most of us in this room are very familiar with cyanobacteria as a, a serious public health threat. And um, we know that animals, um, as well as humans using water bodies for recreation, um, or, or treating uh, water for drinking purposes um, certainly are at danger of um, either poisoning by cyanotoxins from acute effects or um, alternatively chronic effects or even effects which are unrelated to the toxins and other compounds in cyanobacteria which induce effects like vomiting or nausea and, and things like that. So there are a variety of negative health impacts from cyanobacteria which is not only related to the toxins but also related to other compounds um, that they produce as well as that aesthetically it's an, it's an eyesore and it's, uh, you know, I doubt anyone here wants to go swimming in, in bright green water. Um, and in addition, we all know that uh, cyanos increase the cost of water treatment and um, examples from the states and, and, and elsewhere where, you know, water supplies for cities have had, had to be suspended um, due to lysing of cells and release of toxins into, into water supplies. So I think I don't have to labor the point too much, but we all know that cyanobacteria pose a, a, a real and um, growing threat. Well, why remote sensing? Well, there's a number of reasons. Uh, the first thing is that it's a, it's a two-dimensional information source. Um, generally, when you go out into the field and you're sampling, you're typically sampling from one isolated point, uh, which means you're getting an incomplete picture um, of what's actually happening in your water resource. And the larger your water body, the greater this um, problem becomes. 
Um, so when we talk about minimum target size, people always ask me, well, what, what's the smallest target you can see? Well, at a medium resolution, you're looking at about a, a kilometer squared target, and at a high resolution, you're looking at about a 100 meter squared target. That's the co sort of size constraints that we deal with. And um, you might say to me, well, why is this the case? Well, um, I would then point you to the uh, engineer who would tell you that it's impossible to get a satellite which overpasses the same point every day at a, at a signal to noise ratio of 1,000 to 1 and at a radiometric sensitivity of <laughs> whatever, um, etc. So there are real design constraints around satellites which constrains what we can do. But having said that, we can do a lot more than we could do five years ago today. So global coverage as well. There's no limit to where this can operate. And uh, by the end of this year, we're looking at a four to six times a week frequency of observation, which is completely unprecedented uh, when you compare it with anything you can do in situ. Unless, of course, you're investing in autonomous technology. Um, it's rapid response. In other words, the latency from our system is less than two hours. So for example, it updates daily at 12 o'clock. So if there's a bloom at nine in the morning, you're gonna see it by 12. And um, it's cost effective thanks to the Europeans who've invested billions of dollars in their Sentinel program, um, which means that these kind of solutions are now feasible. Um, what makes SinoLakes unique and different from other things that are out there? This is a question that people ask me often. And often in the business case, you have to make this point uh, because people say, well, we've been having this. We, this is old hat. We know how to do this. Well. Um, we operate around a paradigm which is not around imagery but information. We believe that utilities are not interested in getting imagery on their computers. What they want is information for decision making. And so that's our paradigm. Um, we're not an imagery company. You're not paying us for imagery. You're paying us for information which helps you to make better decisions. And yes, they are maps, but the focus is not on providing you with hundreds of gigabytes of maps which are impossible to interpret. Um, the other paradigm we operate around is public access. And um, this is important because um, we believe that public data should serve the public interest. And um, if the public aren't empowered to make decisions around their recreational activities, well then that's a huge challenge. Um, certainly the responsibility of authorities and utilities is to ensure public safety. And so we contribute to that by providing public access data. Um, we're also focused on people. Uh, we've built this around the needs of real clients, um, particularly the National Department of Water and Sanitation. And they've used this data already to report to Parliament in South Africa on the national status of eutrophication and cyanobacteria. Um, something else which makes us unique is that we develop, validate, and design our own algorithms. And um, this is something that um, of course, there are many parts to an algorithm, but uh, it's an ongoing thing that we invest in and develop in. We currently have a, a PhD student who's funded through Sinolakes who is developing some pretty awesome stuff, which uh, is quite exciting, but I don't have time to tell you about today. Um, open access, that's another thing which makes us unique in that uh, we believe that if your algorithms are open, it enables the scientific community to validate them. And I'm going to show you examples where the open algorithms that we've published have been validated by many different people and in many different science peer review publications. And uh, this is an advantage because it allows people to independently verify the information that you're providing. If your algorithms are closed and you patent your algorithms, it means no one else can test them uh, effectively and use them. Um, and also, uh, this business model and idea was the winner of the 2014 Copernicus Masters uh, Challenge, which is a business competition um, that anyone can enter from around the world, which is still actually running, uh, run by the European Union, for ideas of how to turn their information, which they've invested billions of dollars, into real uh, business ideas which actually make a difference in people's lives. So uh, it's hopefully a proven idea. And here we stand three and a half years later. <laughs> So let me tell you about some of the main features of, of what this thing actually looks like. Well, we, we provide near real-time information around cyanobacteria health risk levels, and these are based on World Health Organization guidelines for recreational water use. Now, I understand that in every state in America, there's a different guideline, and we can, uh, we can take whatever guideline you are using and customize it according to your thresholds and levels. <clears throat> um, 
However, we believe the, the WHO is a pretty good place to start. <laughs> Uh, secondly, what we do is we provide a nutrient pollution level, and this is based on the OECD trophic status uh, threshold values, which is based on the chlorof chlorophyll, um, chlorophyll A uh, concentrations. Um, we cannot detect nitrates and phosphates from space, I'm sure you already know that, but uh, we base it on chlorophyll, which is a very robust indicator of um, biomass, algal biomass, as well as nutrient pollution in 99% of water bodies. There are natural sources of, of um, tr which drive natural trophic status in many lakes, which is not related to nutrient pollution, but certainly in South Africa, um, that's not the case. 99% of uh, eutrophication is caused by anthropogenic sources. Um, and then lastly, we provide a recreational advisory, which is um, for full and partial contact uh, water sport. And so um, this allows the general public to get an idea of the safety for full contact and partial contact water sports. And this is, a, um, this is an advisory that we came up with in partnership with the National Department in South Africa. And uh, I, I will also add that South Africa's um, sort of level of advancement in terms of water guidelines and water recommendations is, is very advanced. We have a National Water Research Commission which is specifically designed to fund uh, research into water and I'm sure many of you are aware of South African colleagues who really are on the cutting edge of, of cyanotoxin research and eutrophication research. And so i uh, just give you some background into the actual values that we're talking about. Um, <clears throat> The uh, first table um, presents the cyanobacteria risk levels, uh, which range from low to very high and are color coded, um, as you can see on the screen. So the first thing we do is we say, well, can we detect cyanobacteria, yes or no? And if it's a no, well, then it's a low risk. Um, so the sensitivity to cyanobacteria is about 12 micrograms per liter. Uh, which means that if your bloom is below about 12 micrograms per liter, we're not able to detect it from space. As I said to you before, you must be aware of the limitations of all technology, and we don't hide what the limitations are. In fact, we advertise what the limitations are so that you can interpret it correctly. Um, then at a medium level, once we've detected cyanobacteria, if it's below a biomass of 50 uh, micrograms per liter chlorophyll, uh, which equates, um, if you use a basic conversion to cells and microcystin toxin, below a 20 um, micrograms per liter microcystin level. Of course, I understand there are hundreds and thousands of different types of toxins and uh, et cetera. However, if you look in the guidelines, pretty much microcystin is the only toxin that you're gonna see there. Um, and so I understand the um, sort of science behind this, but uh, please understand that this is a, a rough conversion and a preventative approach. However, the, the, the value for chlorophyll is an absolute value, whereas the values for the cell counts and the microcystin are derived from the value of chlorophyll. They are not derived from their own algorithms. That's very important to, to note. Uh, because we don't believe a microcystin algorithm from space is robust. In fact, it's not robust. Um, so um, then at a high level, uh, uh, correlates to a chlorophyll between 50 and 100, and then a very high risk correlates to a, um, a chlorophyll greater than 100. Now, you might actually go and dig into these guidelines and say, well, how did you get to these actual values? Well, you have to read between the lines in the guidelines in order to apply it like this. Um, but we believe it is true to the spirit of those guidelines. And of course, um, if you would like different values, we can make it whatever you like for your customized site. Great, so moving to the table below that, um, the nutrient pollution level um, also ranges from low to very high. And uh, this correlates pretty much straightforward to your uh, chlorophyll concentrations, which relate to your trophic status. Uh, I must admit that there is one change here from a, a 30 to a 50 microgram value as far as eutrophication is concerned. And we've just found that a, a 30 microgram for hypertrophic is, is quite low, and generally 50 is a more acceptable value. Great, so um, let's go through some more of the product features. Now I've explained some of the more technical backgrounds. Um, <clears throat> Uh, there's first of all, there's a, a summary dashboard which provides an overview of all the water bodies that are subscribed for in your area. 
Um, there's searchable time series maps and tables, which you can view, as well as interactive charts and um, downloadable remote sensing products as well. So if you wanted to do your own analysis on the, on the product, you, you are welcome to do so. Um, there's also an API, which stands for Application Programming Interface. And this is very, very important, because let's say you've spent millions of dollars building your own online warning service. And you say to me, well, we don't want to use this one. Um, what you can do is you can just build a little program which takes all the data from this um, program and pulls it into your own um, program through the API automatically in near real time. So you'd be able to uh, get access to the back end information which has all the concentration data, throw that straight into your monitoring database which you use for management and reporting, or alternatively throw that straight into your app that you've already developed online through the API. And this makes it a very powerful tool, makes it extensible. Uh, so in terms of the actual maps, um, there's a chlorophyll map, there's a cyanobacteria count and microsystem concentration maps, and there's also floating vegetation and cloud maps. So floating this algorithm actually does three things. It detects um, floating vegetation, cyanobacteria, as well as um, algae in water. And when I say floating vegetation, I'm talking about floating aquatic macrophytes like water hyacinth, something that's floating on the water surface that has a unique signal. So let's go a little bit more details into the algorithm. I need to hurry a little bit. Um, but the algorithm is called the maximum peak height algorithm, and it was the first algorithm to quantitatively distinguish between cyanobacteria and algae. Um, and it's de derived from high quality in situ and satellite matchups and has been extensively validated and inde independently tested in more than 300 lakes around the globe. Um, it is open source and available as a plugin in the uh, Sentinel application platform software. And it's been used in many peer review publications by other authors as well as used in education. Well, let me give you a bit of a background as to actually how we can distinguish cyanos from algae. Well, firstly, it's based on their unique pigmentation, um, phycobilly proteins. Uh, secondly, the way they scatter light in the presence of gas vacuoles in the cells. Um, in my PhD, I went down to molecular level and did a model, which is a two-layered sphere, which simulates how cyanos actually scatter light. If I had to do that, you would be extremely bored. I will not do that right now. Um, so, but it has been done, and you can go and read about it if you really want to. Uh, and then thirdly, the way we distinguish them is based on their physiology. These are quite easy bugs to see from space. I'm sure you've seen plenty of maps from Sentinel-2 and Landsat where you see this bright green stuff on the water surface. That's just because they make themselves very amenable to detection by the fact that most of them like to float. Now, this makes them distinguishable from algae, proviso, provided you have a sensor with sufficient spectral resolution and sensitivity. So that's very important. So this is example of algorithm validation. So um, it was processed for 340 inland waters around the globe uh, for Maris. Uh, there were 14,000 same day matchups from 42 lakes. And uh, I'm very proud of this uh, graph because uh, BRR MPH on top of this uh, graph means that it's the best performing globally of hundreds of algorithms that were compared. So that's a pretty awesome result and fills me with a lot of confidence and hopefully should fill you with a lot of confidence as well. Um, so it's, there's another great example of a fantastic paper by my colleague Jamie Pitak in Spain. And he took the algorithm and independently validated it in um, a lake in Spain, uh, a lagoon. And uh, this is the values of chlorophyll versus the MPH, um, as well as the in situ versus the measured chlorophyll. And um, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but this is really an amazing result that he found. I was a reviewer on the paper, and I said to him, do me a favor. Can you get hold of sino cell counts, and can you compare it with the index values? And this is what, we've, what uh, he found. Uh, you can see that the index value varies almost exactly with the cell counts for sinos. And this result shows you unequivocally and undeniably that this is working fantastically as a cyanobacteria detection method. And this is independent work by my colleague, Jimmy. No, I'm not a co-author on this paper. <laughs> 
Uh, this is another great graph showing you exactly the power of time series of satellite data. So this is 10 years of data on the x-axis and the chlorophyll value over here. And you can see it kind of going up and down seasonally. And what's really great is that this uh, phycocyanin index here becomes redder and redder, which means it's more and more cyanos in the water, uh, corresponding basically with your, your summer and your spring blooms which occur there. So this is, uh, so just to take a quote, the use of remote sensing provides an unprecedented view of seasonality and changes in cyanose blooms occurring in the lagoon, substantially increasing our understanding of the dynamics of the system. So as you can see, this is extremely powerful and really, really useful. So um, I just did some validation recently uh, in South Africa and um, using uh, the ocean and land color instrument. And um, we had a total of 216 matchups from 43 water bodies. And uh, we got a, a pretty good correlation. If I take out some of the water bodies, it looks even better. But that's uh, the kind of correlations that you're looking. And I'll, I'll just put a proviso and say that none of that data was collected for the purposes of satellite validation. In other words, the time and location, the exact time and location of that sample is not really verifiable, and it's also a single sample, meaning it's a single chlorophyll value, which is far less than ideal. So this data is not collected for validation, but we're seeing a great correlation in any case. Great, so I'm actually going to show you a demo of um, the website now, provided it works, of course. <laughs> Great, so the first time you open the site, there'll be a pop-up, but that's not coming up, but that's okay. So I'm just gonna sign, you can see that we're processing data from a couple of lakes around the globe currently, uh, like the Curonian Lagoon in, um, in Europe, uh, like uh, Lake Tresimeno, uh, Sea of Galilee, Lake Taihu, etc. cetera. And um, there, there's more than 100 lakes in South Africa, which we're processing, and we've added 10 lakes from Australia as a, as a demo for this morning. How are we doing for time? Okay, nine minutes left. So I'm just gonna log in here. And if you wanna follow on your laptop, you're welcome to. And I'm gonna log in with the login name New South Wales and the password New South Wales. Great, so that logs into the uh, site for New South Wales. And um, over here, this is the, the summary overview that I talked to you about a little bit earlier. So it gives you a, a quick overview of what's happening in all of your water bodies. There's seven water bodies being monitored, and um, you can see the bars indicating the cur current cyanobacteria health risk. Um, that is medium and very high, and the trophic status or nutrient pollution level, which are uh, low and, and medium. And this tells you that there are currently five of these water bodies which are, have uh, are recommended as suitable for partial contact sport and zero for full contact. So if you scroll down on the page, you can see when it was last updated, which was actually yesterday. Um, it updates at about 12 um, local time every day. And uh, you can see the, uh, the dams that are in this particular example on the map. And um, as I scroll further down on the site, you see there's a nice table um, which uh, shows you some of the relevant data that you may be interested in. Um, the health risk uh, and approximate count for the cyanos, that is an average value, not the highest or the lowest value for any pixel, um, as well as um, the, the other values there. So you can actually, let's say you had 100 dams, you would be able to search this quite easily and find what you're looking for. So what I'm gonna do now is just click on the map here so you can see the different dams that are, sorry, water bodies which are being monitored. Copeton, Glenys Creek, Windermere, uh, Barandong, Wayang Wayangala, my dad told me it was something like that, uh, Bl Blowering, <laughs> and Hume, <laughs> right. Uh, good on you, mate. <laughs> Okay, so uh, now I'm gonna show you the maps because that's what everyone wants, everyone wants maps. 
All right, let's go and have a look at a map. So I'm going to click through on Hume because it's enormous and quite fun. And I saw that there was a cyanobacteria bloom sitting somewhere in the water body. So I'm just going to go to a nicer looking day over here by selecting yes, by selecting Sunday's data. And yes, I did, you know, set this all up. No, I'm joking. Okay, so over here, you've got a couple of different layers on the map, as I said earlier. The first layer, of course, is your chlorophyll layer, which I'll draw now. You can see it coming up there. You can see the scale. It's pretty much absolutely clear. Chlorophyll's almost zero, except in a couple of spots upstream. And then I'm going to turn on the cyanobacteria layer. And according to this, you can't see it very well, but up over here, there's a seems like there's a, a couple of cyanos hanging around. And uh, I'm going to turn on the, the layer which shows you the, 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 the high-risk areas. And there's a couple of high-risk areas according to this data, not verifiable, no provided without warranty, um, that there's a few areas upstream which represent a, a health risk. Now you'll notice that the, the risk level is very high. Um, however, 99% of this reservoir is in perfect condition. And I would say to you that if you're a utility and you're monitoring this water body, you would think that it's absolutely perfect and completely safe. However, um, we believe <laughs> that we need to actually come into the 21st century with our monitoring and actually have a better overview so that it can, st even if there's a tiny corner of a lake which represents a high risk, people deserve the right to know about that and to, um, and to certainly take care and, and be careful. Great. Uh, you can see there's also a vegetation flag here which is marking some um, areas and um, that's most likely land which is um, being de de detected there. However, it, it could be, um, it could be uh, floating aquatic vegetation. If you scroll down here, you've also got time series graphs which are sortable um, and uh, represent an ability to show you um, time series information. <coughs> Great, so uh, I don't want to take too much time on this, and I'd encourage you to go and uh, uh, really just explore it, try to break it, and then send us feedback. So now I'm just going to log into Melbourne, and again, username Melbourne, password Melbourne. And I've just got three water bodies over here that I've loaded up, and uh, you can see them over here as I zoom out. And uh, let's take a look at a very small reservoir like this sugar loaf. Um, and I will say one thing over here is that people say to me, well, the maps don't look very sexy. Look at the size of those pixels. Don't be ridiculous. Uh, well, I went to a talk once, and um, this guy's a hero of mine. Uh, he was looking at lake surface water temperature from satellite in Brazil. And this friend, this highly esteemed friend of mine had one pixel, one pixel that he was using to determine lake surface water temperature. And that guy is my hero because he teaches us a very important lesson. And that lesson is that one decent pixel is worth a thousand crap pixels. Excuse my French. Okay. Now just hear what I'm saying here. Okay. Let's say you've got a brand new instrument in your lab that you've just purchased. It's fresh out of the, you know, fresh from the, you spent a million dollars on this thing. Then you've got another instrument sitting in the corner which is 30 years old, hasn't been calibrated in 10 years. Which data are you going to trust? The option's yours. It's exactly the same with satellites. There's no difference at all. They're just instruments measuring things. That's all they are. And so the Europeans have sent up these babies producing this data, this is your brand new instrument that's being calibrated at, you know, a billion euro cost. Um, or you can choose to use that old um, sensor that will go unnamed, um, which provides you a beautiful picture. But quite frankly, the value of your information is about zero because you can't trust it. So um, although this doesn't look very sexy, it is very accurate. And so that's actually what matters when it comes to making decisions. That's what matters when it comes to uh, warning the public is actually, do we have accurate information? 
And yes, we are working on high-res data, and we can give you high-res maps as well of this dam, um, but it's going to cost you a little bit more, as any high-res stuff costs you more. Um, but uh, this, I, I just wanted to show you a nice dam which was super pixelated, so you don't get your expectations up too high. <laughs> Great. So I'm actually done with this demo, but I'd encourage you to play around, send me nasty emails telling me that it doesn't work, um, etc. Uh, go ahead. Uh, that was a joke. Okay. So what are the benefits, and I've got one minute left, is enhance your monitoring and reporting, basically. This is not to replace your monitoring program. This is all about enhancing. It's all about supplementing. It's all about actually making better decisions, being so much better informed, and um, that's what it's really about. And um, it's also about compliance. Um, yes, there are issues in that uh, maybe the... The, the big boys upstairs, the government are going to say, hey, we don't trust this data, kick it out. But they will come around. They will come around um, eventually. Um, reduce your long-term monitoring costs because if you know where the problem is, it allows you to streamline. And maybe you shouldn't be spending thousands of dollars sampling that lake when there's nothing there. <laughs> um, so prevent and manage your risks, improve your decision-making, and the health and safety of your waters. So what kind of services do we add? Uh, well, there's obviously a customized login, uh, medium resolution maps, API access, continuous updates, improvements. So um, we're not the kind of company which is going to sell you software version zero. One year later, oh yeah, another $20,000 for software version 0 .0 0.0.1. Another year later, oh, 0 0.0.012. Uh, so any update and improvement that's coming your way, you just, you're just going to get it as well. It's going to be great. Um, free product validation using your data. If you provide us with your data, we'll validate it and improve the algorithms for your area. No worries, mate. Um, staff training and technical support. And if you want annual reports, uh, like we've done in South Africa, we just wrapped up a three-year project there where we did an, an, an annual reporting for you know, 100 dams around the country based on this data. And it's, it's pretty awesome. So I'm going to finish with this quote. I think I'm one and a half minutes over time, but you'll forgive me for that. Uh, monitoring on a national scale is very expensive, logistically challenging, and labor intensive. The Department of Water and Sanitation is in support of this eye in the sky approach to monitoring eutrophication, which will allow monitoring of more water bodies, which were not considered in the current network. The remote sensing information will allow us to optimize our monitoring network and streamline our activities. The data generated will lead to significantly improved ability to manage and mitigate the harmful effects of potentially toxic cyanoblooms and nutrient enrichment, which are widespread in South Australia, I mean South African dams. And with that, I greet you and thank you. Cheers. <laughs> Do we have any uh, quick questions before we can, or we can continue down? Yep. Nick? So, um, you know, as a guy who worked for eight years on the drinking water side and, and helped manage Sugarloaf Reservoir, I think what, what I'd like to see is, uh, is the phrase, not locally validated, or something to that effect. Like to see? Not locally validated. Not locally validated. So what? the problem that I see with the data you're presenting yeah. is that, well, to start with, you know, Australian waters. Some of them have colours which are not experienced overseas, yeah. and particularly uh, down south where we have quite different colours. Uh, right. We've never had a problem with cyanobacteria in Sugarloaf Reservoir. Right. Um, so the reason why this is important is that we supply uh, five million people, and yeah. social media is the sewer of. Of, of communication, so it's very important that yeah. messages come with ca come with caveats. Yeah. So if you know if your if your data point is not in your validation set, please put that on the website. Yeah. Because you know within a day, that's on Facebook, and then three days later it's in the Age. Yeah. And and that's that's really important because the currency of water utilities is the confidence that people have in them.
Thank, just leading on from that the question, I was going to ask Mark was yeah. was, was a, a similar. What what by making the information public, right. what impact have you had in, in South Africa on on that ver that very thing that that actually yeah. um, uh, the reaction of, of perhaps the public versus the reaction of managers uh, who yeah. who actually might have a different opinion. Right. Yeah. Um, well, I think we've actually had a, a very, very positive reaction from the public in South Africa who are saying, wow, actually now we can see what's going on. Um, I think there's a, there's a very real uh, challenge in that sometimes managers don't want to know <laughs> and don't want to tell people what's actually happening. So we, for example, um, there was a big outbreak of water hyacinth, and I, I don't have time to, sh to show you it, but it's really a fantastic example. And I encourage you to go and, and try and look at how to be a sport dam in South Africa. Uh, there was a huge outbreak of water hyacinth on this dam. It covered most of the reservoir. And um, the guys were using this to kind of track what was happening and uh, manually remove that, uh, that hyacinth. So I think the reaction from the public has been really good. We've had a lot of articles in the media in South Africa. And um, certainly um, there are instances where it isn't going to work. And uh, yeah, it is important to work with uh, local managers to make sure that you know, we are actually um, not making invalid uh, assumptions. Um, and so in, in the case of uh, setting up examples and locations, we would work closely with any local authority to do that. Uh, this is not kind of um, a fly-by-night you know, a uh, gun ho kind of thing. Uh, all I was trying to demonstrate here was simply that we can monitor these water bodies in Australia no different from how we're doing in South Africa. So certainly if there are water, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a specialist in bioptical remote sensing. <laughs> I know very well when it w is not going to work and when it is going to work. But I can't, I can't know that unless I have the help from someone setting it up locally. So in which case we can you know, not use it or use another algorithm, for example. So, thanks. So, the question I have is yeah. the assumption then that from everything you explained yeah. was that if you've got cyanobacteria cells, yeah. the assumption is that they're producing microcystin. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Because, I mean, we monitor a lot of the <laughs> Melbourne water sites and yeah. there's no microcystis or yeah. any algae that produce microcystin in yeah. those water bodies. Yeah. So if we know for a fact that those algae aren't present and microcystis isn't being produced, then aren't you scaring, potentially, causing fear in people who are going to go, oh my goodness, I better not go swimming there because there could be microcystin then there, whereas there, we know for a fact there isn't anything that has a potential produced microcystin, which is a toxin associated with cyanobacteria but not all cyanobacteria. So you're sort of making some assumptions that then people are going to... I suppose we, we do have a lot of issues with... Um, we want to make sure when we're telling our, client, our public that they shouldn't be swimming somewhere, that that's based on fact. Yeah. Um, that's been tested and proven and, you know, because there's thousands and thousands of dollars involved as well. You know, if suddenly people aren't going to that part of the country and they're not swimming in those water bodies because... You've told them don't go there for Easter this year, don't go to Lake Hamilton or something, then that's mm. going to really impact on the community. And so the assumption that you're making is going from a chlorophyll result to a cyanobacteria cell count to a microcystin level. And yes. they're all assumptions each step of the way. Yeah, of course. So, yeah. um, okay. and I have, I, that is a completely open assumption. And uh, if you look in the World Health Organization guidelines, they did exactly the same thing. <laughs> and uh, the, the reality is, I'll respond in two ways. This is one to say that maybe you misunderstood what I was saying. We actually provide chlorophyll values. We don't provide microcystin estimates. So um, over here, uh, cell counts and microcystin, you can actually see these conversion calculations at the bottom. I don't believe it's robust to produce microcystin maps from satellite, not at all. Uh, I would never do that, and I have never done that. There are publications which do that, and I do not subscribe to that um, science. Uh, however, we don't do that. We provide you with a chlorophyll estimate, which we know is from cyanobacteria. Now, a chlorophyll that is from cyanobacteria, you need to assume that that could be toxic, because we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
Okay, so this is the second part of my, my answer, is that we are not a government agency and we do not issue government-issued warnings. If you don't want to make this public, that is your decision. That is up to you. You are the one who needs to issue the warning, not Sinolex. And that disclaimer is on our page, and you can go and read it on our page. Uh, uh, thanks, Richard, for giving me this opportunity to ask one. Yes. Um, Mark, I mean, it, it was a very good presentation. 2007, when we went through <coughs> in Adwaragamba Dam, uh, we created uh, this kind of uh, matrices using Burns Index and Carlson Index. And we had our own issues because uh, they are, again, with gross assumptions based on nitrogen, phosphorus, and chlorophyll. Uh, multiple problems we have. Sometimes the cell numbers, I mean, you talked about it as well. Cell numbers is a very misleading parameter. Yes, um, sino, all the um, smaller ones, sino nephron, sino um, neptune, and all sorts of things are very small, and they would be misleading. If these numbers are put out, yeah. it would be a mess. I don't believe there is a probe that can tell us uh, between microcystis versus uh, dolichospermum. I agree. Even we had 800,000 um, uh, cells per mil microcystis in our, in our waters. Yeah. Uh, luckily, Britain Island was available uh, to do the qPCR for the first time to quantify the percentage cells that can produce toxins. So these all things are available. I mean, I know it's really difficult to put all of them out. Yeah. But if this is put out, people would misinterpret the numbers. You're right, I mean, Sinolex is not responsible for that. Yeah. So that is one of them. One last thing I wanted to ask, this should be an early warning system. Right. If the numbers are in the 50s and 100s, people can see it. Yeah. They are not going to put their leg in. But if it is five, seven, nine, that's when we need some kind of an early warning so that people can avoid getting into those waters. Right. And that part yeah. is not well developed. Right. Most of the times we put a simple plot with a large number, hundreds and two hundreds, whatever numbers they are, you have a good R squared, and we claim it's a good straight line. Yeah. I'm concerned about the bottom left corner, yeah. zero to 10. Yeah. Hardly any software, hardly any model can predict that part well. That's right. That's again, right. I'll stop this soapbox. Yeah. Thanks again for the opportunity. Well done. Yeah, thank you, absolutely. So I completely concur with absolutely everything you've said. Uh, a, a cell count algorithm I have serious reservations with. However, we are doing the conversion because World Health Organization does it. So, you know, we can pull that out, uh, we can put it in, uh, but what we do know is that we do have an accurate chlorophyll algorithm, and we can do chlorophyll. Um, and then, uh, yeah, sorry, I can't remember what you, what you said after that, but early warning, yes. The minimum sensitivity of this algorithm, now people might say to me, you heretic, is one milligram. And the sensitivity dependent on the atmospheric conditions ranges between one and seven micrograms per liter. In other words, if we say one, it could be seven. Excuse me, Mark. So yeah, the sensitivity so, is a major issue. Can we, and, uh, yeah, we are aware of it. Can, can sorry, we finish I, up and? Yeah, sorry, I just yeah. wanted one quick comment, and, and not necessarily for a, a question, but something to stir a bit of discussion amongst some of the utility managers here. I wonder about the legal framework with this in terms of private consultancies looking at, and for instance, a project that I'm looking at with diatomics and remediation of blue-green algae within a lake, and wanting yeah. to use something like this as, as, a, as another aspect to that monitoring and try and get some correlated data, yeah. what the actual legal framework that is for, for someone like me that is a private consultant that wants to do good science. Right. Um, and in terms of approaching utility managers and, and the like um, to be able to do this, because I think the legal framework might be different. So if anybody's yeah. got any comment on that, I'd be, I'd be interested yeah. to have a chat. That's good. Okay. All right. Thanks Thank for you, the uh, Thank you. energetic discussion. Um, <laughs> and we can now cool down and have a morning tea. Um, we've got about 10 minutes uh, or so, so hopefully we'll get back at about 5 to 10. Thanks, Mike. <laughs>